Like we are so happy to invite James to join us today to talk about women leadership. And uh, James, uh, I read uh, read his uh, profile. You know, he has so many ex uh, so much experience, and then I'm gonna leave the time for him to introduce himself. Hi, James. Hi, Sherry. Thank you very much for your kind words. So, Sherry, my career, my professional career is varied. I started out to be an academic, and I became an academic. And I've lectured uh, at numerous universities across North America, including McGill University in Montreal. I have a 30-year-plus experience uh, in senior leadership-level positions in the United States and Canada, and as well as, um, as a management consultant and a professional executive coach. Some seven years ago, I founded the Bonner Institute for Purposeful Leadership. And the Bonner Institute for Purposeful Leadership is a boutique professional consulting firm with a track record of building high-performing leaders and teams. We work with clients in business, industry, government, entrepreneurs, really quite the gamut uh, across North America and increasingly uh, we're taking on engagements uh, globally. So it's an exciting time for us and it is a, tr a true pleasure to be here tonight with you. Yeah, it's our pleasure too because uh, uh, the today our topic is to thrive not only survive. This is comes from uh, uh, James. The uh, James gave me some material. When I see that words, I feel that that's really like the. Uh, it's really like I like it because it's we're talking about from the mindset, not only skills. Uh, that's the way. So. That's why, like today, is to kick off. So I'd like you to get to you uh, your wheels on how you feel women leadership. So I, I've been very privileged. I've had <clears throat> I've had a number of very very good women bosses, and I've also had the privilege of having a number of very strong women people reporting to me in my various roles. Uh, there's one example I'd like to share with you. <clears throat> it is a company I worked for for a number of years and it's called Walters Kluwer. Walters Kluwer is in the information. Um, it is really sharing professional information uh, with uh, companies and governments and they're very successful. Their competitors are Thomson Reuters and Reed Elsevier in uh, London and in the Netherlands. So Nancy was appointed as CEO, global CEO of Walters Kluwer some 20 years ago. And in her 20 years, or just close to 20 years, and in her close to 20 years at the head of Walters Kluwer, she transformed the company into a global professional information and software company. So right now it's the third most important uh, global company in the world. So she's, uh, she's a very successful individual. I was fortunate enough to work with Nancy early in her career as a peer. We were both running different business units. Then she became my boss. She became CEO of... Um, of Walters Kluwer's North America. And then uh, she became global CEO and I got promoted, so she was still my boss. But she, what really impressed me about Nancy was one, her, her incredible ability to be able to rise as she has successfully, but her preoccupation for being, for professionalism her preoccupation for detail, her preoccupation for fairness, and in a word, to create a meritocracy so that people would be judged based on their merit, not on other attributes, meaning not on gender, not on, um, not on who they know, 
but really on merit. So she was a very, very strong leader. And as I said, I'm very fortunate to have met a number. But when you have leaders such as her, you can only think of women leaders in the highest, or hold them in the highest of esteem, which I do. Wow, well, that, that's really a great story you, you are uh, just telling us. And just sometimes, like, we just feel, um, when we see it, because well, women uh, in the executive or in higher level of, uh, as a leader is still not as that many as uh, uh, the, fi uh, the male uh, uh, CEOs. So once you working with her, like uh, you are the, she is your boss, do you feel anything like I'm the man, I should be uh, in that position? Do you, like, I don't know, from man's point, like a female point of view, do you have that kind of feeling like in some? Uh, I personally do not. Mm -hmm. uh, most of my colleagues, at least the ones I'm close enough to, to, to speak to, mm -hmm. uh, did not. Mm -hmm. uh, she, it, her sheer competence mm -hmm. was such that <laughs> that's what we had, that's what we dealt with. Mm -hmm. And we tr I trusted her, mm -hmm. and as did others. So the question of gender really didn't come up. But you raise a very interesting point about women who reach even the highest points, mm -hmm. is that um, women leaders today are still struggling in a male-dominated hierarchy. Yes. Because when we look at boards of directors, they're still, at least in North America and in Europe, they're still very much um, male-centric. And they're also, in many, many ways, very much male and white-centric. And so uh, it's difficult. And women typically don't make the same level of salary as, uh, as their male counterparts. It's starting to change. There are laws in the United States, for example, and here there's a greater recognition in Canada that uh, it, it's not only wrong uh, morally and legally, but it's also counterproductive uh, because you want to get the very best people you can to do the job. And there's starting to be increasing recognition for that. But this is something which is difficult for many women leaders today. Yeah, that's that's true. And uh, when I'm checking uh, your, uh, uh, the women leadership program, and mm -hmm. you uh, mentioned about one called imposter syndrome. That's, <laughs> I think, the most popular, like what's called uh, uh, woman facing, get in their way, right? So that, can you talk about that? I, I, yes, I can. It's funny, um, I was doing some coaching work for the military mm -hmm. and imposter syndrome uh, was was an issue that was brought up by both men and women. But in terms of the imposter syndrome, just perhaps if there's anybody who isn't quite uh, familiar with the term, what it means is that you feel, you being the individual, that you're in a position and that deep down in, your, in yourself, you feel that you're not qualified to hold that position. And you have a fear, a great fear, that you will be discovered as being inadequate. This paralyzes many, many people. From, I would say, from uh, managers to the CEOs to board members. It, it goes all the way up. And it's debilitating. It stops these people from performing at the level that they can. And it also stops them from being able to project themselves to their peers, to their clients, to their employees as the leaders that they are because they don't believe it. So the good news is, because there is good news, 
Always it is. News. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my job. <laughs> but really, the good news is is that you can work on that. And uh, I can't say that all of my clients have, have rebounded brilliantly, but a good number have. And it's not just because, you know, I'm such a wonderful coach. It's because these people, when they're given time, when they're given a mirror to see their strengths and their qualities, when we do that, they then see themselves differently. And when they, can, when they start to see themselves differently, when they start to see really their talents as they are, they start to believe in themselves. It changes everything. Just briefly, I had one client who started off uh, because I used a test, an emotional intelligence test to measure some of these elements. Mm -hmm. and when we first did hit this test with him, he was at the lowest level you possibly could be. And everybody thought, did we make a mistake <laughs> in putting him as a leader? Mm -hmm. The answer was no. After nine months, he went from being, you couldn't get any lower, to being in the top third of all leaders. Okay. Uh, and today he's even doing better. So this is to say, and this is true of all leaders. I've had, an, I've had a lot of women who have the same issues for all the reasons we've said, and including the fact that there is um, prejudice against women uh, in leadership roles. So it's all the more present. But with these women, we do the same thing. And in just being able to highlight, to getting them to believe, to see the leaders who they are in truth, and once they see it, then to believe it, it changes everything. That's changed everything, huh? So I, yeah, I, I am so believe uh, self-awareness, like knowing ourselves, what's our strength, and what we can do and be confident. That's the most important things, uh, like for uh, women leadership, I think for anything, but especially in women leadership. Because I read a book called uh, How Women Rise, written uh, by one uh, top executive, uh, executive coach uh, called uh, Shali, Shali, I believe, Hagenson. And uh, in the book, there is called 12 behaviors gets in the way, like for women leadership. And uh, imposter syndrome is one. And another one is expecting others to notice. That's uh, like from uh, the book, they said it's the top, top uh, behaviors like women uh, in leadership, like facing it. So can mm -hmm. you tell us something uh, like about expecting others to notice? So, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'll be happy to. So uh, when we expect others to notice, it's often because we don't have the self-confidence and the feelings of self-worth. Self-worth is not egos. Self-worth is just really knowing what our, our skills are, our competencies are, okay. our abilities are, accepting that and moving forward. A lot of people, and this is especially true of, of women leaders, um, they are not necessarily seen that way by their male counterparts. And they're expected to be more demure, to be more, um, to be quieter, and almost to to ask the opinion of their male counterparts first. Uh, this leads oftentimes to a hesitation to put out their, what they believe in, uh, to allow their normal and natural talents to shine. So one of the things I, I share with, with, with women leaders in that kind of context is I ask them to allow themselves to dream big. I ask them to allow themselves 
and it's very difficult for many, to be bold. Bold doesn't mean to be rude. Bold means to dare to live up to your potential. And then I also ask them the last, and that is to be able or to remain humble. So dream big, be bold, and remain humble. Wow, that's true. Dream big, be bold. That's really important. So it now, really is. yeah. Now, David, come. <laughs> John, I'm sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I have Wi-Fi problems. Wi-Fi problem. That's like uh, we we talk with uh, me and uh, David. David, uh, me and James, we talk. This is not David. This got to be something like a major things happened. <laughs> yeah, with the Wi-Fi issue. Okay. Yes, I'm part me. I'm, I'm <laughs> rural Canada. We don't have great Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay, so we have well, a storm going on. Oh yeah, today the weather thunderstorm, right? Yes. Oh okay. So uh, uh, hello everybody. Now let's start to uh, introduce uh, David Fraser. Uh, that's it's, uh, like he is our old friend. I think like if uh, uh, we work in women's friend, I think like uh, there's several times we see David like uh, join us. And then today we are so happy uh, he come to here and then talk about women leadership with us. So uh, David, uh, please introduce you again. <laughs> Uh, Sherry, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, I'm actually uh, a soldier who, who served with the Canadian Army for 30 years, uh, mainly as operations overseas around the world, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, across you know, Eastern Europe. I, I've been out for 10 years where I have been in the private sector as a leader in a startup company in manufacturing uh, and today i am now working with a financial institution the bank of montreal i am the author author of a best-selling book called operation medusa and a uh, new book that will be coming out in the fall called the anticipant organization which is leadership in the digital age so i um very proud to be with you again tonight, and Sherry's a friend. Uh, I love your organization. I've had a, a privilege of talking to your members before, and uh, look forward to the conversation tonight because I do believe that diversity is a strengthening factor for every organization, and uh, women leadership is particularly important and something we should all embrace because it makes us all stronger over <laughs> over <laughs> okay <laughs> that's sh soldier <laughs> over <laughs> we just i just talked with uh, james uh we said to, like if you don't speak uh, you don't wear the uniform so we cannot tell you are uh, a general but when you start to talk <laughs> So right away we know you are the you are soldier. <laughs> okay, so we just talk with James about uh, um, how uh, his views on how you feel like woman leadership. So can you tell us, uh, David, what what uh, we want to get your views on how you feel about uh, woman leadership? Well, first of all, I think leaders, it, it's important that we look at people as, as it, from the inside out. And I think leadership is something that is irrespective of race, creed, or sex. Uh, but we also have to appreciate that there are institutional biases. I will say in the military, it was very much a male-dominated society when I joined uh, we have become much, much better, but we are nowhere near where we need to be, where we embrace diversity, which includes women. And I would go so far as to say that the, it, the lesson of women and diversity really came home for me in Afghanistan, of all places, where 
we were working in a multicultural, multi-ethnic community in Afghanistan, very much tribal based. And we brought over that same community, but in a Canadian flavor, where in fact, I was the minority in my leadership team because I had two women um, that I absolutely respect, uh, particularly Christine Green, who was my development advisor, and the three of us, my political advisor was a woman, my development advisor was a woman, and I was the security lead, but we represented a Canada and we represented it also a multicultural, multi-ethnic capability that really did more to teach Afghans about the power of leadership and of diversity where we didn't all agree, we didn't all see life the same way, but because we didn't agree, we were actually better. And I would go to say another corollary of that is that the U.S. system of education ensures that there is a diversity of thought when they educate their people so that when people come around the table, they don't all agree and say the same thing. They come from different perspectives. And I think that's where female leadership really comes to the fore in many organizations, it provides a diverse point of view, which makes an organization better. Yeah, that, that's true. And uh, diversity always brings new ideas, uh, the new things on the table. Uh, that's, I think, Canada, why it's so, uh, what's called, like everybody wants to immigrate here, right? Like that kind of uh, environment. And I, I was just talking with uh, James, like when we're talking about diversity and uh, uh, different opinions. And uh, I was talking with James for uh, uh, there is one behaviors that uh, a lot of women uh, leaders have that is called expecting others to, uh, uh, to notice. So James gave us a lot of uh, thought on that so david do uh do you like um uh, experience that from uh, the other women uh women's in either in the military or in the private sector very much so it a couple of stories if i could about the difference in leadership that when we were st starting up our company, we raised $80 million and started up a, a certified organic uh, protein company. And when we were pitching the opportunity, interestingly enough, the male people that we talked to in, in investment banks and in private equity understood the business and understood the numbers, but we had to take them and walk them through some time about the idea of certified organic food. We talked to a number of we, female leaders and they automatically got it much faster than the men got it. <laughs> they understood about the idea of, about uh, feeding, nurturing, and right away they could ask a couple of skill testing questions and then they immediately went to the financials and, and, you know, went through the scrutiny for that. But I found that there were, they actually had a lot more breadth and depth uh, in a conversation than, than the men we were dealing with. So there, there was that piece itself. Um, and I think the other thing I've also learned is from my wife, who is a woman in uh, the hospitality business, and she has... She grew up in Europe and then she worked in the, uh, the Middle East. What she was able to bring was, again, a lot more sensitivity, cultural awareness, and her ability to break into markets in the Middle East did. She was able to do what men could never do. And again, that is something that uh, the diversity on your leadership team, she was able to build out markets because she understood there was another part of a family unit that wasn't just the man. And she was able to build up with women and in a way that she could. 
uh, that most male leaders could have never been able to understand. And that's, again, I think the, the positives of having that diversity as a, as a leadership team that we don't, we don't take it for granted right now because we, we are still too rooted in the past. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to ask next question. So now both of you here. <laughs> uh, so what uh, opti uh, obstacles, uh, obstacles do you see like a woman leader like facing these days? James, can you start with it? Yes. Um, so if, if I'm hearing you correctly, is what are the obstacles women leaders have to be able to take their place, uh, their proper place in business or whatever, in a leadership position. Uh -huh. I think David touched on it when David was talking about in terms of, of, um, of the environment, uh, uh, the cultural environment, be it of a company, be it of, of a government organization, towards leadership and that leadership is essentially a male endeavor. This is starting to change but it is taking time to change. So we're, we speak oftentimes in the corporate world of the glass ceiling. The glass ceiling is still very real. However, increasingly, we're seeing, and the example I gave earlier about the CEO of Walters Kluwer, Nancy McKinstry, and there are many, many others who are breaking, or at least putting cracks in, in, in the glass ceiling, and they're able to go through the cracks and up. The more women who do that, who have the courage and who are bold enough to do that, the better it is because it allows the situation or it allows other women leaders to have examples of leadership, to see somebody like them, meaning women, at the top. David was also speaking about the fact that they're increasingly, the increasing number of women leaders or, or uh, he was speaking about his his management or his leadership group in Afghanistan. Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. something that at our company we take very seriously too because we want to have a multicultural, a multi-ethnic, but near equality in terms of gender. And so far we have about 45 of our senior associates who are women and but the number of associates is is an uneven number so uh we're hoping that the next associate will be a woman and that will bring us up to 50 50 but we're doing it on merit so the people we have are extremely competent skilled experts in their area of expertise and they're a pure delight to work with and they're absolutely respected by our clients oh that's that's so good. Uh, David, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that, on top of what James talked Yeah, I think the, ch the challenge that women have, uh, less so with startup companies, but with what I would call mature institutional companies, is that a lot of those companies have processes and perhaps a, an attitude a behavior that is male oriented and therefore even with a with a meritocracy and and a lot of big businesses in the military is very much a meritocracy where you you grow based on merit you still have to challenge of that male attitude that uh will always be there because it just takes generations for attitudes and behaviors to change the other thing I think is challenging is that no female leader should ever feel that she is a percentage or a commodity just because she is a she. And I think that is something that some companies do better than others. It, it also is a detractor in some cases um, because female leaders are, are people and they have to feel valued. And if an institution is doing it just to because they want to be socially acceptable, that's not the reason why you want to bring in a leader like that. And as you said, female leaders have a diversity, uh, create a diversity, as does the LGBTQ community, that is important. 
because it's representative of society. And I think if you have a leadership team that's representative of society, that's irrespective of commodities or percentages or whatnot, any organization is going to be better. And I think that is an ongoing fight that everybody has to deal with and, and acknowledge because either it's explicit or more or more difficult, it's it's unstated. And I think this is where sensitivity training and having uh, enterprise resource groups inside companies is important that you you acknowledge that it's going to take time. You acknowledge that you've got to come out and work on this and not just accept it when you actually bring a woman in or have a female leader. That's that's not good enough. That That's only the start. And it's all about dialogue and communications. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. uh, I like very much what David was saying. Uh, what I would also perhaps like to build on a little bit is that when we're talking about uh, leadership and we're talking about women, David was saying they shouldn't, we shouldn't see it as a commodity or, or check off or check off a, a box. And he was talking about other communities. And he's absolutely right. Um, one of the areas that touch women as much as men, but very much so, is organizations are having a great deal of difficulty managing the generational divide. And so that they're today increasingly more and more bright young women who are coming in at leadership levels. So they almost have two strikes, one, the gender, and also the generational issue. And then they may have others too, in terms of, of racial and in terms of sexuality. So David is quite right. All of these comes under the greater scope of uh, really being of inclusiveness and bringing people in. Uh, there is an awareness uh, about these issues at board levels. There is an awareness in legal, uh, as a matter of fact, legislation, uh, but, the <laughs> but there has to be a follow through and there has to be an efficient application uh -huh. or, or, or uh, or execution of these policies. And that's where sometimes it falls down. So I just wanted to, to build on David a little bit. Yeah, I, I noticed like now, like so many big companies, they are like working on that. But sometimes yes. uh, we just feel like it's unconsciously, like kinds of some uh, environment, like have that kinds of you know, that kind of environment, maybe consciously, like everybody's, everybody knows it should be more equality, this and that. But under the table, sometimes it's just happened, right? So you're right. There are conscious biases and unconscious biases. What we're starting to see in other areas, though, is one of the drivers is really shareholders. We're talking about larger companies, of course. Mm -hmm. But the shareholders, at least in terms of, of ESG, the environment, uh, sustainability, and governance, they're, they're influencing the direction of company, not only in terms of what kind of, of investments these companies will make, but also in some of the issues we're speaking of. So uh, it, it's beginning, it's imperfect, but it's starting. And I think that we can serve to reinforce this going forward. And there's still a crying need that we start working on and do a far better job on the gender side. Because we've been speaking about it now for decades and it's been improving, but very, very slowly. Yeah, it's, it's been improving since like you see in COVID start like all uh, the several uh, countries like uh, really dealing with it is so good it's all female leaders <laughs> they <laughs> are. yeah and if we look if, if we look at the the chief medical officers of most of the provinces in canada mm -hmm. in many many of them at least they're women uh not not in quebec and not in ontario but if we look elsewhere many of them are women and you're absolutely right about the leaders <laughs> 
some of the more <laughs> most effective countries that are dealing with these issues are women. Yeah, and I would like to, I'd just like to single out the Prime Minister of New Zealand, uh -huh. who perhaps was one of the best examples of how to manage a pandemic where she took a pay cut, leadership by example, she shut down her country, and from an economic point of view, New Zealand's probably the least affected country in the world uh, from the pandemic from an economic point of view. Mm -hmm. She was disciplined focused and exemplified everything that we would expect in our a political leader or leader in general okay. she stands out amongst uh most of her peers that's that's true and another question i want to ask when we're talking about the leadership the first words come uh, to my mind before is to like let people to follow you but what do you think about the leadership? If you use a couple of words, just you, uh, you think the most uh, important for the leadership, what's the couple? May, may, I, may I build on what you said? Okay. You said a leader, the most important thing for a leader is to follow you. And so that there is, there is a whole view of leadership that says leadership is influence, meaning. Yeah. And influence is leadership. Yeah. So a leader who really embraces influence will then be in a position to present arguments that's going to enable people or, or create an, a situation where people want to do, want to follow. Mm -hmm. In that situation, we have a very effective leader. Yeah. Uh, we hope that that leader is principled and has values, because that has to be there too. Yeah. But so just for your question, influence. Influence. Yeah. David. So, you know, I always ask people when I talk about leadership, I ask people the question, what, do you, what is leadership in your own life? And there's no right and wrong answer, but mm -hmm. define what leadership is. And, and just for the sake of discussion here, it's to get other people to do what you want them to do. In the military, you add the, the phrase when they don't want to do it because it's in an environment which is atypical and abnormal that you're actually putting your people's lives at risk. And in many cases, you've got to be prepared that you know somebody's going to die or get hurt. So it is about getting people to do what you want them to do. But how do you achieve the what? And first of all, leaders have to be able to create trust. Mm -hmm. And we talk about trust an awful lot, but trust has to start somewhere. And I always start walking into an organization. I always said this, I will lead by example, deeds over words. But first and foremost, I will earn your trust. However, you have my trust explicitly and implicitly, I trust each and every one of you because you are already here. You have to unearn my trust. And, and that is a very powerful uh, sort of drug in a way that you have now given not only the responsibility, but the authority to your people to do what you've asked them to do. You've empowered them. We, and that's another term. We always talk about empowering. We talk about trust. But how you do it, I give it. I give it to people. And then I, I turn around and I say, unearn it and do so at your own peril. And then uh, the other thing that I think leaders have to do is they have to listen. Not just be on send, but listen. And let me give you an example, a story. I was running an organization of thousands of people and, and I would go out of the office and I would go down and I would talk to the, the men and women on the shop floor. And, you know, there would be a contourage around me and including their bosses. And one day I'd be looking at, I was talking to a, a, a private and he was really uncomfortable. So I asked the sergeant with us, go grab us a coffee. And he kind of looked at me and he, but he understood and the private had something on his mind. So the private, when the sergeant was gone, I said, what do you think? And he told me he had an idea of how to do something better. 
And he had a great idea. And I said, that's a great idea. So I'm going to bring you up in front of my, my planners, and I'm going to tell the planners of senior officers and non-commissioned officers, to listen to this person and don't worry about the cost. I'll cover the cost. Listen to this person because they've got the answer. And by listening and by, you know, talking to everybody as if they were and are equals, even in a hierarchical organization, you actually generate a lot more trust and respect. And that's leadership. And the other thing is, Finally, another story that, you know, generals have a lot of staff around them and everyone thinks a general just gives orders. <laughs> I actually followed orders a lot more than I gave them in many senses because my, my secretary would take care of my calendar. My personal assistant would take care of my travel arrangements. My, my executive assistant would run the office. They told me what was going on every day and what I was supposed to be doing. What decision that I have to make? And so leaders or effective leaders listen, give trust, and follow direction from their team as much as they give direction. It is a very sophisticated concept. And when you've got an organization like that, it will be unstoppable. Yeah, that, that's true. Like I really learned a lot. Influence, build trust, and uh, that's like a two so important thing, right? To listen, yeah. So what I really like about what David was saying is, um, it, and David, if I get you wrong, I apologize, <laughs> but I know you'll correct me, it is that- <clears throat> You haven't been wrong yet, James. Oh, <laughs> no, but, but what, what David's talking about is in that context, everybody is a leader. And if the, if the person has, if we have the humility to listen, as David was saying, and to allow people to express the leader within, so to speak, we all come out on top. And I really, really like what David was saying about trust. I was working uh, with a very big, uh, very big corporation. And the unit I was working with was highly, highly dysfunctional. And I asked them, a simple question, is trust earned or given? David explained it very well, I thought. They did not agree. The top, top management said it had to be earned. The people right below them said it has to be given. But it should have been a 10 minute conversation. I had to stop after 50 minutes. It was a huge disagreement. So I realized that there was a significant issue there that I brought forth and we worked on. But David is so right to insist on, on the importance of trust. And I think, you know, and, and I'm going to build on James that that idea of humility mm -hmm. cannot be overstressed. Um, some of the best leaders in the world have a lot of humility because leadership is about teamwork. It's not about me, myself, or I. Uh, no leader can do it by themselves, especially today in the digital world. A good degree of humility uh, and all the other things we talked about, I believe, makes people actually more effective as part of a team. Yes. And, you know, that's not to say that you, you cannot be determined, persistent, um, and at times in crisis when their time is, is at the essence Leaders have to be decisive. And, you know, being decisive does not mean that you're an autocrat or dictatorial or uh, a warlord. At that point in time, everybody understands, and in crisis, people want to be led. Yes. But, but, you know, at times, you know, a decision has to be made, and this is where you kind of lean into it. And, you know, being the old general, I'm pretty direct because I don't want to waste time but it's designed for a purpose so that all of those concepts put together makes up a leader. Yeah, that's true. I think like sometimes uh, when we think about leader, just uh, like special in the uh, military, escape the orders. But some, uh, it's really, truly, it's just enable everybody, like let them like really, uh, they willing to go for extra mile. And as a team, 
I think that's the really leaders. Interesting. The CEO of Microsoft. He was giving、uh, an interview a year or so ago、uh -huh. to the Stanford University Business School,、uh -huh. and、uh, he was speaking about leadership and where he sees leadership. The, because everything is in transition, everything evolves necessarily, and the evolution he sees now is that people are moving、uh, from transactional to purposeful leadership. So by transactional,、uh, I think he meant the the sort of command and control environment to purposeful in the sense of more directional. There are limitations,、uh, and part of the limitation is in in David's prior world.、Uh, there are situations that are life and death, and where decisions just have to be made, and somebody has to take the reins and say we're moving forward. But what they were saying was at a, at another level, though, is is to be able, you know, outside of that, in,、uh, of those situations which are very real,、uh -huh. is to be able to see and to be able to be able to move in that direction, and to get people in your organization to buy that vision.、Uh -huh. Buy that. And I think. Yeah. And then James James picked up on a thing, and it's it, and again, there's something on. Leadership theory that I, I've read for probably forty forty five years now is purposeful leadership is also something we used to call、uh, transformational versus transactional. Transactional is you do A B C D. Transformational is what we call in the military mission command, where I tell you what to do, but not how. And so, allow you to use your own cognitive skills to 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 achieve the what, but but in the way that you wanted to achieve it. It's it's far more empowering. And but the other thing I would also say, and again, it's it's a concept that is talked about a lot for a lot in leadership, and it's easy to say is be yourself. Not everybody is a trans. Transformational leader.、Um, many people are a very good transactional leader, but you have to be who you are. You cannot pretend to be a George Patton, a Winston Churchill,、um, a Bill Gates. If you're not, just be who you are, a Dave Fraser. And it, when you do that, people will accept who you are,、um, as long as we do the other things of you know being humble, listening. Giving of trust,、uh, people were very accommodating because we are all unique, and that makes us powerful.、Mm -hmm. There are situations, though, that require certain types of leadership. So perhaps、uh, in a, in a situation of conflict,、uh, there might be a need for somebody who's more、uh, transactional. Or you know, or at least those elements. There are ways that if a if a company is having financial difficulties, they're not going to put a CEO a marketeer. They're going to probably put an accountant. If they're at a time when they're going to build, if they want to survive, they're not going to put an accountant as CEO. They're going to put somebody more in business development. You know, to oversimplify. So there is a situational element. But I take to heart what what David is saying because I think you know at, at a higher level he, he, what he's saying is absolutely true.、Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I have another question: like, what is your advice to younger professionals or entrepreneurs, like who are navigating in their workplace? Especially、uh, now today, we said female leaders. What kinds of uh, uh, advice? You gonna give it to young professionals. So,、uh, if I may start,、um, it's it's interesting for me. You asked the question because I was in that position two nights ago, <laughs> and my <laughs> and I was asked to give my advice on that. So I think、uh, I may have mentioned it earlier, but if not, so it is one. It is to follow your passion. To allow yourself to dream big, to be bold, and 
yet to always, always remain humble. That's not only tactical so that people will like you and, and press follow you, but it's just important because when you're humble, you realize that you do not have all the answers, that you may be mistaken. But I do think that for people successful, especially the young, that this is the advice I give them. Wow, that, that's uh, to be humble and to the young people and to be bold, to dream big. That's James gave the advice. And to follow your passion. Follow the passion. Uh, okay. Dave, well, what kind of um, advice? I, I, okay, I've got a couple of things I would offer up for discussion. Get yourself two mentors. A female mentor and a male mentor. And, you, and I think you need both. Uh, because both, both have different views. And again, somebody probably a little bit older and then somebody a little bit younger, but you need to have sort of some diversity in the mentorship. So you get some feedback about what you're doing, which is different than a coach. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is ask a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to talk. Uh, when you're coming into a job and whatnot, you know, it's one thing to listen, but you have to ask questions about how things are done, why things are done. That question, why, is it really a good one? Because it, it actually forces people to think why they're actually doing something they've probably done for 20 years. Uh -huh. um, and the fact that you can't change it all, but you're going to have to adjust and slowly adjust with how that organization you're in does things and how, how you can adapt to that and make it stronger. And going back to what James said, if it isn't a passion when you're in there, get out and go find something that becomes a passion. Because if it's just a job, it's not going to satisfy you. You're not going to be happy. They're not going to be happy. The other thing I would say is you got to be persistent. <laughs> Nothing's got, nothing worthwhile happens easily. It's hard work. All right? You just have to work through it. Uh, and, you know, it's easy to say. And the other thing is you got to force yourself to think through problems and not just kind of, you know, shoot from the hip, but think through it. Critical thinking is important, which means you have to read an awful lot. The journey of reading and being informed and not just the stuff that you want to be informed on, but other things that you may not agree with. Um, I, I look at a wide range of, of uh, media liberal to conservative and some of the stuff I don't want to read, but I do read just to find out how other people are thinking because it tells me what I'm, what my biases are without, you know, we all have them. And even with the internet, we're actually becoming less informed as opposed to more broadly informed. And I think that that is something that will help you as a leader. As long as you're broadly informed, you will understand your people and understand some of the things that are happening. Um, and the other, last thing I will say is try to make sure that you're in hybrid groups uh, and not just groups of, of like-minded people, uh, you know, because the more diversity you have in the groups that you're talking about, they will challenge you, you will challenge them, and you will grow. But if you're in a in old guys club, and I, I look at my old veteran, you know, cronies and whatnot, we're just old boys now slapping each other on the back and telling the same old war story. But um, I say that to illustrate a point that we don't, we're not in an organization anymore, but that type of thinking isn't beneficial. You, you have to bring in some other fresh ideas and you know, young thought. And by being in those types of what I would call hybrid groups, it'll help develop you, you as a leader. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, like you both mentioned about, uh, uh, I think that most important to build a relationship and with different kinds of people. So mm -hmm. you have mentors, coaches, because that can bring different kinds of wheels like to, uh, to, uh, to let you grow. That's important, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, form of, that the, the diversity of opinion that diversity of thought 
And that is oftentimes fostered or, or helped create it by having people from different areas or multi, multidisciplinary, multicultural, multi-ethnic. That is incredibly useful. And that's... I'll, 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 and I'll, 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 I'll jump in here to say, I always put on people on my team. I never put a yes person on my team. I wanted somebody that could stand up and walk in my office, shut the door and tell me that I was wrong or have a conversation around the table and argue a point that I'm saying up until the point where a decision has to be made, then we all click our heels together and we get on with it. But having people that do only agree with you does not make an organization stronger. So, yeah, go ahead. so what David is saying is very important because that what's predicated by that is that the leader is able to create a situation where, uh, in his case, perhaps a soldier or an employee will come in and feel safe enough to be able to speak truth. And that is so important for a leader, for a coach, for whomever. Uh -huh. But that, but that is, uh, I think what David has explained, uh, uh, the example he gave is extremely important. And it just highlights the other side uh, of, uh, or another element of truth and of trust and of safety. Mm -hmm. That's, I like it. Yeah. And just so now we still left to six minutes. Let's, let me see what uh, the our audience talking about because there's uh, <clears throat> something oh okay Hansi just repeated leadership uh, is about influence it is super well said I'm so inspired and Aaron said leadership is creating trust powerful you have to unearn my trust Powerful. <laughs> I agree with your opinion that leadership is a, a lot of influence, but how to improve or expand our influence? Could you please give me some suggestions or examples? That's the question. How to improve or expand our influence? Could you please give me some suggestions or examples on that? Well, what well, I can I'll, tell. Go ahead, James. Okay. Well, David, you go ahead because what the issue I have for that is is we have a <laughs> we offer a whole training program on that, and so I'm trying to in my mind to to narrow it down. Uh, but I'll I'll just pick on some of the points perhaps that David mentioned earlier. It is it is to um, to listen to the other person to present uh, if you have something to share to the other person, uh, honestly, clearly, uh, diplomatically, but, but not, you know, there can be no hesitation. It has to be very, very clear. If the person is going to take it badly, you'd be able to say, all right, now is a time that we're gonna put this aside and we'll come back to it. Uh, either say that I see you're upset, why don't we reschedule a meeting, or I have another meeting and so forth. The, uh, the art, and it is an art and a science of influence, but it really does start with, with being able to listen to the person, being open uh, with them, sharing what you have to share, and moving forward. But as I say, we, we do have a six-step program on that. So that's why it's a bit more difficult for me to condense it. <laughs> they, you can probably do a better job of condensing it than I did. <laughs> uh, I think it comes down to uh, the study of hum what I co coined called human geography. I'm a human geographer. I love the study of the people. My, the organization, whatever organization I'm in and its influence, I listen to people, but not only do I listen to people, I ask people to tell me what's on their mind. And let me give you an example. 
So I, I normally started my day in the Army with an intelligence briefing, and it's normally an officer that stands up and reads a whole list of what happened the night before, what's the bad guys or the competitor's intent is, yada, yada, yada. I looked around the room, and I started looking around the room, and instead of the normal briefers, I looked around the room and I started out looking for people who were squirming. And then I asked that person to stand up and tell me what you're thinking. Because obviously you're, you've got something on, on your mind and you want to tell me, which is a bit of a shock because, you know, a two-star general asking a, a private or a, a major, that's not what they were expecting. And I said, no, get on the front of the room and tell me what you're thinking. And they did. And we would have a conversation. And then I said, every day I'm going to pick somebody else and I'm going to ask them to tell me what you're thinking. What it did was it made the entire organization more of a thinking group. We now got away from ranks and hierarchy, and we just started engaging in a conversation where everybody started to contribute. And our influence of, as an organization didn't come from my, from my position. It started being everybody was starting to influence what was going on and they had their own networks and so we were empowering and taking the power of people to its maximum and that's how you increase your influences by getting everybody thinking and talking so find, find an example for you to get more conversation going on with your team mm -hmm. And, and engaging their networks. So if we're talking uh, in influencing, and if we're talking in terms of techniques, uh, thank you very much, David, because I thought that was extremely important and well said, but it also gave me time to think and to think back. One of the things that's important from a technique perspective is to do what, what David is saying, is to listen to find out what's on their mind. That, that's important. Two, though, is to try and understand what's in it for them, meaning what are they really after, what is important for them. Three, is that once you've determined, you know, what, what's on their mind, what is in it for them, then you have to determine the approach you're going to take with that individual. Some people are analytical, some people are emotional, some people are of a higher rank, a lower rank, or what have you. And they all require different positions, different approaches, because what you're doing is you're trying to convince them, you're trying to sell an idea to them. And once you've done that, then you start the conversation. But even before you start the conversation, then you have to determine what is going to happen if it goes wrong if they're going to be offended or what have you. And, you know, David talks about an anticipant leadership. So this is anticipating as many situations as you can. And then to have a way uh, to momentarily take a pause. It could be a day or two before it gets out of hand. And then you come back to it and you then conclude it in the fifth step. <laughs> okay, Dave. Um, I was in, uh, how do you increase your influence outside of your organization now? Go and start talking or engaging in groups you wouldn't normally engage in. Let me give you an example, a story. Uh, Medicine Sans Frontier, great organization. The way they, they are so good is because they ignore and they don't come near people like me in the battlefield anywhere in the world because they're, they're not a combatant and they're not aligned with anybody that the bad guys would want to worry about, like somebody like me wearing a uniform. So they maintain their independence very strictly. And we've come over 40 or 50 years of, of combat in many uh, uh, worlds around environments that we don't know how to talk to each other. So we, we got together once in a conference in Toronto 
where we, we sat down and looked at each other for the first time in the same room where we would never have been and went, I know what you do and you know what I do, but we don't know, we can't talk to each other. Maybe, And we had a conversation and found out that we could actually help each other out and still be true to our mandates. And the influence about that, it was a shock to both of us. But we would have never done that, but we forced ourselves to go and talk to a group we wouldn't normally talk to. Mm-hmm. And and the power of doing that, we we took away a lot of mis mis miscommunications, misunderstandings, and whatnot. And our influence was actually better in both organizations, while we still respected our lanes of authority. That's that's true. To uh, to uh, get more influence, to so we need to stand up and then get to uh, talk to the new peoples, right? To have that kind of uh, conversation, okay? And there's another question is uh, uh, come from uh, Pansy. I'm running an association with 1,400 members now. Your wisdom just come in at the uh, at right time. Can you be my male mentor? <laughs> Oh, that's, oh, I don't know, Patsy, which gentleman you are asking about. <laughs> and there is a, oh, they said, this is an amazing seminar. What you said here is definitely something not taught in school. <laughs> and Patsy said, both of you, James and David, <laughs> can you be my mentor? <laughs> okay. Um, all the questions we have and uh, today thank you so much James and David like I learn a lot like every time I talk with you uh, you two and uh, I can feel that sometimes people talking about uh, female uh, um, women leadership they just talk the talk but I can tell like from both of you like it really you think that's really important and from your bottom of your heart and you truly believe that it's really uh, the good things to each every organization that's really, mm-hmm. i feel so good about that and at the same time uh, i think uh, me and our audience learn a lot from you guys thank you so much for and thank, thank you, you for the opportunity yeah and the audience so David has a new book coming out. It's called the uh, the Anticipant Organization, right, David? Absolutely. In the fall. Leadership in the digital world. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> also welcome everybody to check James' website. James, can you give us the website? So. So it is bonnerinstitute.com. Okay. So www Bonner Institute one word b o n a r Institute one word dot com. Okay, Thank okay. You. So if there's, let me double check if there's any. Can we take a look at the cover? What what is the name again? The book name. Okay, the book name uh, is David. Can you say it again? The the Anticipant Organization, Leadership in the Digital Age. I will make sure that once it comes out that uh, I will send a link to Sherry so that we can get it out to your people. And if anybody wants uh, any any information or talk by on leadership, either James and I are more than happy to help out. Yeah. So no worries, Pansy. So what? Uh, once uh, James, uh, uh, once David have that information, I'm gonna share it through our WeChat. And uh, so today uh, our live stream is uh, like uh, have so many right now. We have in our which Xiao uh, around 450 uh, people uh, watching, right? Like for that. Thank you, everybody. And uh, so good night, everybody. Thank you, David and James. Thank you.
Okay, bye guys. Bye bye.